good afternoon, everybody. Um, like Lewis said, my name is Rachel Osborne, and I'd like to thank uh, Science for Georgia for inviting me to talk today um, to represent uh, my county, uh, which is Columbia County here in Georgia. Um, and uh, I am the Environmental Project Specialist uh, for the Stormwater Compliance Department, um, which has, I, I, like he also said, I wear many hats. Um, I do a lot of administrative stuff, but I also do um, outreach. Um, I'm active within the permitting young age. Um, my family went to the beach constantly, um, or uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I was constantly on the river or in the lakes in the surrounding areas, always doing something with water, um, which kind of led me to study it. I, I graduated um, from college with a degree in marine biology. And uh, then after college, I became a marine science educator. And after a few random jobs, I found a job in a water treatment lab, which is pretty sweet. Um, and then I got my current job right now. Um, so I've kind of seen a lot of aspects of the water industry teaching in it, in it and then being part of the water treatment process. Never worked in wastewater, but I'm thankful for those people that do because they do a great job and without them, you know, terrible things would happen to our planet. So um, stormwater to me was kind of like the last frontier in the water industry. Um, and it really is a very new and, and up and coming topic. Um, water is very precious and so, if you think about stormwater, you gotta, you gotta think about where it comes from and how it impacts the earth. So we're gonna talk about that um, and when stormwater actually becomes stormwater runoff um, and how development specifically impacts the stormwater runoff. And then we're gonna talk going from gray infrastructure to green infrastructure. I'll explain a little bit more about that and how you as a citizen, whether you're in Georgia or in somewhere else in the United States, what you can do um, to help improve water quality. So we're gonna start on a very basic level. If I can get this to go. Okay, perfect. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. So what is stormwater? Um, it's exactly what it's happened, or it's exactly what you think of. Um, it's precipitation. So in Georgia, we think of rain. Up north, you might think of um, snow. And of course, we have ice storms and, and hail. Um, so it's water that essentially falls from the sky. And if you think about the natural water cycle, you have um, you have evaporation, you have condensation, precipitation and then collection are like the main four parts of the water cycle. And um, when you have a natural, um, when you have a natural cycle like this, uh, you have very little runoff. You have about 10% uh, of runoff because a lot of that water is either going to infiltrate down into the ground or it's going to be taken up by plants and transpired from there into the atmosphere. So, um, Whenever you think of stormwater, you know, in a natural state, we have very little of it and when you don't have human interaction with it, um, you don't have to worry about it so much. So um, at what point does it become storm water runoff? So development changes that natural hydrology of our landscape and creates those hard impervious surfaces like concrete or your roof um, and so the stormwater is not allowed to soak down into the ground, it can't get through the impervious surfaces. So it's going to run off and it's going to act like a, a taxi service picking up all of those pollutants that we, um, that we, you know, put on our landscape, like fertilizers and, and yard waste and pet waste. And it's going to get taken to the nearby storm drain. But where does that storm drain lead? Getting ahead of myself.
Everything that goes down our storm drains ends up in our lakes and rivers. Everything. Um, so you can guess where it goes. It goes into the waterways. Um, nine times out of 10, it's going to go into our watershed that's within our communities. Um, there are things called combined sewer systems, which is when the stormwater and the sewage come together and are taken to a wastewater treatment plant. Um, those are found more in urban settings. So uh, I know in downtown Atlanta, downtown Augusta, we have um, situations where we have these um, combined sewer systems, which have problems of their own, um, which is for another presentation. But um, in Columbia County, we have separate sewer systems. So uh, the stormwater system literally is just taking it from our streets, going into a storm trap and out towards a waterway. Um, something else I want to bring up is the fact that our um, drinking water in Columbia County comes from those waterways. So we wanna to try to protect it at all costs. And I encourage you, um, if you're a water nerd like I am, to actually go ahead and figure out where you live, if it's a combined system or a, uh, a system that is um, separated so that you can act accordingly. So there's multiple different impacts um, of stormwater on the natural world. Um, herbicides and pesticides are a big thing. Um, they are they can be good for getting rid of pests or for getting rid of weeds in your yard, but the application and the over application um, can kill things or hurt things that we don't mean to. Um, so just being aware of that. I live in an HOA where if you have a weed, you know, they write you a, a note and, you know, it can be pretty scary. So you want to do the right thing. So in that case, I would try to um, use those type of chemicals on a uh, a very uh, low, <laughs> low grade. Um, same thing with fertilizers. Fertilizer is food for your yard to make it green and lush and appealing. Um, but once it gets into those waterways, it can cause al algae blooms and it rapidly creates the um, algae to grow um, and to, it, it then at some point dies, it uses up all that oxygen and that's when we have fish kills. Um, so good things to keep in mind there. Auto fluids, um, these things are toxic. They last forever. Um, it's a chemical and they stick to everything. So it's, it's very important to, to maintain your car. And if you're um, somebody that can do maintenance at home, then you wanna make sure that uh, you're not getting any of that stuff on the ground. Uh, litter is another big thing, especially with um, the pandemic. I don't know about you guys, but I would go, you know, to the store and I would see masks and gloves on the ground. I was like, this is a new source of pollution. This is crazy. Um, and, and it really is. You got to think those things are going straight out into the waterways. And yeah, you know, it can get stuck on a bird or stuff like that. But a new up and coming topic is microplastics. What happens to those um, pieces of plastic and litter? Uh, as they degrade and break down, um, you know, most people think that the answer is, you know, bottled water, we just bring, drink bottled water, but they're actually finding it in bottled water and in some of our food. So at what point are we going to make sure that these things are being disposed of properly, hopefully recycled, but at least disposed of properly? Pet waste. Um, I have a cute little dog and I'm not the greatest at picking up after him, but I try to do my best because if you don't, um, the bacteria come off of that, that pet waste, that poop, and it, it can travel right to the waterways. And, you know, those, those elevated levels can really, um, you know, harm the ecosystem. Also something else, because again, if you don't know if it's a, uh, a sewer where it's going to be treated, um, or versus just a, a stormwater drain. Some people don't know that. So people in my community will pick up after their pet, which is awesome, yay for them. But then they decide to throw the bag down the, um, down the storm drain, which is mind boggling to me. I, I work with some guys that use the back trucks and they'll go out and they'll 
they'll unclog storm drains because people are complaining about flooding and they say that's probably the number one thing that they pull out of storm drains, which is crazy. Um, yard waste, uh, again, something like that you don't think of um, being harmful, but as those things break down, nutrients, bam, you can have excess nutrients, which can hurt that watershed again, also clogs up storm drains. Um, car suds is another thing that I never thought of, of before I got into stormwater, but the phosphates and the soap can again cause al algae blooms and then the oxygen is depleted after, once it dies and it causes fish kills. Um, the main thing, especially here in Georgia, is very important to understand and talk about is the fact that sediment is considered a potential pollutant. And you ask, well, why? Well, let's talk about the ecological um, things first. Um, you basically change the clarity of your water. Uh, so thing, it's harder for fish and other animals in that, that watershed to um, find food or to hide from being food. Um, so it can be a real detriment to their habitat in that way. Um, it can also reduce oxygen levels in the water and degrade fish habitat. Some fish need very specific habitat. So if you have all of the suspended or you have sedimentation going on and you change a rocky bottom to a sandy bottom, you've created a non-workable habitat for that animal to reproduce, um, which is a big thing. Uh, specifically, um, something that would be a cause of concern for humans would be um, changing floodplains. Um, Columbia County has a lot of floodplains. Um, so with all the, the active construction going on in the community, uh, sedimentation or sediment control is very important in all aspects of construction because once that uh, sediment enters the waterway, it can deposit and basically shift the floodplain, which is something I never thought about I just recently bought a home two years ago and, you know, I am close to the floodplain. I'm out of it. But if you happen, if FEMA goes ahead and does a new study, um, you as a homeowner could then be considered in a flood zone area and your, your insurance premiums can go up. So it does affect all of us for sure. Um, so now that we kind of understand a little bit of the potential impacts of sediment, um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the department that I come from. Um, this is the fantastic group of people that I get to work with every week. Um, we have seven uh, ENS, Erosion and Sedimentation Inspectors. They have a supervisor. Um, we have a fabulous administrative assistant who does a lot of the complaint calls to people being irate and they have standing water and, you know, she does a fabulous job trying to mitigate those issues and get people the help that they need. Uh, we have plan review, somebody that um, reviews construction plans for erosion control and pollution control. Uh, we also have somebody that's looking at um, the plans for drainage to make sure that uh, once all is said and done, water isn't going on to the neighboring house um, or you know the hydrology that was for the overall development isn't messed up. Um, so we have people kind of thinking about the future uh, whenever it comes to construction. Uh, we have coordinator who coordinates all of our land disturbing permits um, to make sure that if they are moving dirt that they're doing it in a responsible way and that they have um, best management practices in place, uh, which we call BMPs in, in the construction industry. Uh, these things help to keep sediment on site rather than going off site and into a water resource. We have two educators. Um, myself, I am geared towards more of the adult uh, public education, and then my counterpart works more with the youth. And then we have our awesome supervisor who kind of juggles everything in all aspects of the department. Um, we do a lot of permitting. We do uh, reviewing of those plans again. Um, we work with uh, building standards and the planning commission to kind of, again, kind of think about how as our landscape changes, how it's all going to jive together so that in the future we don't have major problems. 
So these are all great things. And it's a good thing that we are thinking about this because as development um, starts to happen more and more in Columbia County, which it's, it's growing at a rapid rate, um, you're gonna see that higher impervious surface. And so, um, you know, you're gonna see a higher percentage of runoff and that creates a major problem, especially in very urbanized areas. You can have up to 55% a runoff because water has to go somewhere and it can't evaporate, all, all of it can evaporate and it can't infiltrate because of those impervious surfaces. So it's gonna go out into our waterways and then that changes the stream dynamic. It's crazy how much something as little as development uh, can change our landscape. <laughs> okay, so um, gray infrastructure is kind of the traditional way of thinking of stormwater infrastructure. Um, so you have a storm drain, it goes through a pipe, and it goes out into the waterway. It might go into a detention pond. Detention ponds are there to hold a large amount of stormwater runoff, um, and, and it basically sits and it, and it uh, allows only a small amount to go out into the the waterways, which is good because it slows it down a little bit, which will help uh, allow stream banks not to be um, impacted so much, which is a good thing. So this is like the traditional way that engineers specifically, when they're designing a stormwater plan, they think of great infrastructure. So I'm not going to read this to you, but per the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency and the Georgia EPD, um, the, the guidance that came down um, talked about the runoff reduction, called the runoff reduction rule, which basically says you either have to capture the first inch of rainfall on site, or you have to uh, treat uh, to remove at least 80% of the uh, total suspended solids. Um, within your runoff. Um, and so might not seem so daunting, but if you're again thinking about that gray infrastructure, it's not designed to capture a detention pond, yes, but in, depending on how big your development, say you have a huge parking lot, you would need a huge retention pond, which could then impact how big your development can actually be. So, um, engineers, you know, are really, really having to kind of uh, evolve and change. Um, and they're using something called green infrastructure to abide by these new permitting uh, guidelines that are being mandated. Um, so what is green infrastructure in uh, low in impact development? They promote the natural hydrology. I think in uh, infiltration and evapotranspiration using soil media and vegetation. Um, the picture on the slide here is considered a bioretention. This is part of our um, uh, performing arts center that we just built in Columbia County. And it's really, really nice because you can see there are there's inlet. We actually came out whenever it was raining to kind of see this design at work but it just lets in the water, it's capable of holding it. And it kind of what, what it does is it allows the water to infiltrate down into the ground, um, recharging that groundwater, um, which feeds the springs around us in the community. There's multiple different types of green infrastructure, um, green roofs. I've never seen one in person, but in pictures, they're just so impressive. Um, uh, porous pavement or pavers, bioswells and rain gardens. All of these are fabulous um, innovations that engineers are using to achieve that uh, runoff reduction. So I kind of want to switch gears a little bit because this all sounds great and dandy, but if you're like me, I always am trying to figure out what I can do as a citizen within the community to, you know, help improve the earth. Uh, and specifically in stormwater, um, it was kind of in the works before me, but I kind of took the idea and I ran with it. Um, I created a rain barrel for my house, and then I uh, presented a workshop um, for our community. And it was a really, really big success, and I felt really, really good about 
um, you know, the conclusion of, of what people took away and it was awesome. So I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about rain barrels um, real quick. We're going to talk about uh, the benefits of them um, and some fun facts and fun rabbit holes that I found um, as I was going through. And then um, I'm going to share a, a video with you that I created of how to actually um, create a rain barrel from start to finish and then we'll be wrapping up. So um, rain barrels are a great way as a citizen to improve your stormwater quality. Um, first off, it, it's great uh, for conserving water. So if you have a garden or a flower bed, this is a great way to not only conserve water, but at the same time, save money on your water bill. Um, these specific barrels hold about 55 gallons of rainwater at a time. Um, and I, there are tons of different systems, but I liked this one because as you can see, there's only one hose in and one hose out. So once the barrel becomes full, it then goes, continues down your downspout, which is, um, less invasive on your gutters. You don't have to clear cut or anything like that, but, um, it's great for conserving water and saving you money again. Uh, it also reduces your stormwater runoff pollution and erosion. So I feel like the rain events recently have become so intense that, um, you know, I swear water is just shooting out of my, uh, of my downspout. So whenever it came to this project, I wanted to put it near my front flower bed. And it's really cut down on the erosion um, from my flower bed, I'd always have uh, mulch or stones or leaf debris um, all over my sidewalk after a rain event. And this rain barrel has actually really helped to cut down on it. And you also have to think um, you're holding back 55 gallons of rainwater, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you got your whole community, even just one downspout, that could dramatically improve stormwater quality because that rainwater is not going across your, your newly fertilized yard, grabbing all of those chemicals and going to the storm drain. So it's great. It also pr uh, promotes plant and soil health. If you think about um, what water treatment um, plants do to the water that they, that they take out of um, the lakes and streams in your community, uh, they have to add the chemicals like fluoride and, and chlorine to the water in order to make it safe for you to drink. And that's great for you and me, it's, it's awesome, but uh, it's not so great for your plants and for your soils. It's used to rainwater, so why not capture it and use that to water it instead of potable water. Okay, so these are like the fun little um, rabbit holes I kind of went down um, because they were questions that I had whenever I was teaching myself, what kind of barrel do you need? So, um, it is recommended to have a 55 gallon polyethylene plastic barrel and it should be food grade. And you should be like, well, why? Um, and this kind of ties into the second question that I asked, can you uh, drink the rainwater that you harvest in your rain barrel? Not with this system, no, <laughs> please, please don't go home and uh, use the rain barrel for rainwater um, or use the, the rain barrel to drink out of. Um, it's not safe, it's not treated. I don't know about you, but I don't power wash my roof. Um, so, you know, there's bird, bird poop and grit from your shingles, it's dirty. Uh, bacteria is everywhere. So um, you don't drink it, but so why do you need a food grade barrel? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it actually does. Um, food grade means that it was safe enough to carry something that we consume. So um, in these specific 55 gallon barrels, blue is the, the standard color to get um, that is considered food safe. But um, there's also like a semi natural color that you can also get. Um, the difference between these two barrels, you can use them for this rain barrel project, but the blue won't let light in. The, natural color will. So you have to actually paint that 
um, to prevent it from uh, having algae growth inside, which can cause smells. And it, it really isn't something that you should be putting on flag, kill your flowers because of the, the chemistry that's going on inside of that, that barrel. So just all good things to know. Some other rabbit holes, because I kept on asking or getting asked, isn't rain harvesting illegal in the United States? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe I should figure that out before I, you know, go ahead and, and, and do this. Uh, so the answer is no. Um, all, all 50 states, it is legal in all 50 states. However, some states have more restrictions on it. They don't say no, but you, you know, you might only be able to gather so much. Some states have rules that you, you can harvest rainwater, you can only harvest two 55 gallon barrels of it, and then you have to use it on your property. You can't just you know, take it to your grandmother's house five miles away. Um, so there are different rules, um, different design standards. And so I asked, I, I kind of was like asking myself, well, where did this whole illegal thing come from? Uh, this, this notion that rainwater harvesting is illegal. So in some states, specifically out West, there were restrictions um, because of old water laws. And to me, that's wackadoodle. Like, why would you think of water as being, somebody having a right to water over you? And it was because, you know, back in the day, you didn't want one person monopolizing on all of all of the the water, so it, it was a first come first serve um, laws in the old west, and but it was to maintain the ability for everybody to have water. So that's kind of where that illegal. It, it, it was I think most recently Colorado was the one who um, apparently it was illegal for rain rain harvesting to happen, um, but it ended up um, that, you know, they went back and they do have restrictions, but it's not illegal anymore. So uh, then I asked myself, you know, is it illegal in Georgia or are they, there any restrictions in Georgia? Um, and so no, according to the plumbing code, it just has to be used for outdoor irrigation. So that kind of covers the states, um, you know, not being able to, to it covers covers them so that you know hey we told you so please don't drink this water it's just used for irrigation outside so after creating my own rain barrel i was able to teach a earth day uh, rain barrel um, class it was like our first rollout since um, the pandemic happened i had let's see 13 people attend um, it was in the middle of the week, which was kind of strange. So, and I limited it because I wanted to make people feel comfortable. And it was outside, which was great. It was at our, one of our recycling facilities in Columbia County. Um, and that's actually where the barrels came from too. Um, barrels are kind of hard to come by. You can either, um, sometimes Craigslist, you'll, you can find warehouses that have barrels. And I've never done this before. I was lucky enough. I, actually do inspections at the uh, recycling facility as an industrial uh, stormwater inspection. And I was doing my rounds and I saw these barrels and I was like, what are you doing with those? I was like, no, we're gonna have a rain barrel workshop. You need to hide these um, because I wanted to make sure that I had enough for everybody who wanted to come and make a rain barrel. Um, but uh, they came, they kind of went through a similar presentation as to what I just gave you guys. And then we drilled two holes because um, I wanted everybody that was there to feel good and positive about um, using the hand drill or the, the power tool because that was something that made me nervous. I am not that kind of a person to use a power tool, um, but I wanted to make sure everybody felt good about doing that. And then I gave them all the resources that they needed digitally uh, to install it on their house and also make a brand new one if they wanted to. So and that digital package included written instructions that I created, um, troubleshooting issues. So like if you do have algae growth or winterizing your rain barrel, um, I kind of discussed that. Uh, 
there was a rain barrel fact sheet to kind of go sharing what I found down my little rabbit holes in, in rain harvesting and rain barrels, the benefits of rain barrels, as well as um, our county actually incentivizes uh, rain barrels. So you, if you're in the urbanized area in Columbia County, um, attached to your water bill, you're actually charged a very, very small uh, fee that's based off of your impervious surface on your property. Um, so if you have 50% of your downspouts covered, you can get um, up to 20%, I think, on your stormwater credit fee. So um, that's kind of a nice little perk too. The other thing that I um, gave them was a link to the video because I wanted to make, make it as user as friendly as possible. So I have that video here and I would love to share it with you guys. Through this video, I will be sharing how to clean, paint, assemble, and install a rain barrel on your property. First things first, you will need to gather all of the materials for this project. Please refer to your written instructions for more detail. Now that we have all of our materials, let's get started. First, let's determine where we want our rain barrel to go. When determining the location, ask yourself, is it within three feet or less of a downspout? Is it close to plants that need water? Is the location level or will I need to grade the ground to create a level surface? Should I also create a rain barrel stand, which will help with water pressure and ease of access to the water? For my rain barrel, I repurpose landscaping bricks to create a circular stand. Now, we need to clean the inside and outside of the barrel using one-to-one -one cleaning solution. You make the solution by combining a half a gallon of distilled white vinegar with half a gallon of warm tap water. Dump the gallon of cleaning solution into the barrel. Lay the barrel down on its side and roll around to ensure all sides have been rinsed thoroughly. Empty the solution out. Repeat if the residue inside the barrel persists. Using your water hose, rinse the inside of the barrel and empty out the water. Clean the outside of the barrel with warm water and a rag. Dry with a towel. Once dry, lay a tarp down and use the sandpaper to rough up the outside of the barrel. This will allow the primer and paint to adhere to the barrel better. Clean off any dust from the barrel with warm water and a rag and then dry the barrel with a towel again. Now, it's time to paint. Make sure to paint your rain barrel in a well-ventilated room or outside. Painting is optional if you have a barrel that is blue. These barrels are already UV resistant, which help inhibit the growth of algae. If the barrel is light in color or transparent, the entire barrel will need to be primed and painted before you can decorate using acrylic paints. While making this rain barrel, I coated the barrel with two coats of primer and two coats of exterior paint with dry time between each coat. I live in a community with an HOA, so I decided to go with a neutral solid color. Once you are happy with the color and design, seal your rain barrel with a top coat to prevent fading and chipping. Now let's determine where our spigot, water inlet, and diverter holes will be during our installation. Place your rain barrel in the determined location with your stand if you will be using one. Decide the orientation of the barrel in reference to the spigot and water inlet locations. Keep in mind that you will not want to drill along molding seams or raised symbols impressions on the barrel. Measure up five inches from the bottom of the barrel if you are using a stand and measure up 10 inches from the bottom of the barrel if you are not using a stand. Mark this area with a pencil. This will be your spigot reference line. Place a level on top of your barrel and measure over to the downspout on the three inch side. 
Mark this area with a pencil. This will be your diverter reference mark. Now measure three inches down from the top rim of the barrel and mark it with a pencil. This will be your water inlet reference mark. Now that we have marked your reference lines, it is time to break out the power tools. For safety purposes, please be sure to wear your safety glasses and gloves. Let's start by cutting the hole for the spigot. Attach the one and a quarter inch hole saw to your drill using the provided mandrill. Place the tip of your drill bit onto your reference line. While applying even pressure, cut the spigot hole into the barrel. Repeat the same process for the water inlet hole using the one and a half inch hole saw and the diverter hole using the one and eighth inch hole saw. Insert the rubber seals into the spigot and water inlet hole. Take care when cutting and removing the piece of metal from your downspout. The edge will be sharp. Insert the diverter cup with the cup and orientation arrow facing up. Secure the diverter to the downspout by using the two screws. Connect the fill hose to the diverter and the water inlet ensuring a secure fit. Lastly, install the spigot into the bottom seal. So um, I wanted to kind of end my presentation with this quote, which I really love. Um, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. Um, I love this quote because it makes me think about my actions, especially being a mom um, and what I'm showing my daughters. I hope that they can, you know, carry it on and share with their friends and their family one day um, in the hopes of protecting this planet. Um, and protecting those water resources that are so precious. So um, our actions can help preserve those resources. Uh, so I encourage you, um, if it's not a rain barrel, then something else, Some doesn't matter, you know, little actions can make a big impact. So with that, any questions, feel free to email me um, or uh, yeah. So thank you so much uh, for inviting me to talk.